Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Howard Kurtz. Oh, good evening, everyone. For those I've not had a chance to meet, my name's John Highbush. I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thank you for coming this evening. In honor of our men and women who defend our freedom with their uniforms around the world, if you would please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, please be seated. Well, it is a genuine pleasure to be here tonight to introduce Howie Kurtz. I say that in part because Howie and I have something in common. We both worked for organizations called to the Evening Star and the Washington Post. Now, I'm not surprised that we never ran into each other in the hallway or the cafeteria, and that's because I delivered the Evening Star and the Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> and how we actually worked there. <laughs> So, while in truth we didn't work together, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and I did follow Howie's career, first as a writer at the Star and the Washington Post and the New Republic uh, and the Washington Monthly and the Daily Beast, and the list goes on and on. If you haven't had a chance to track his remarkable and successful career closely as a writer, and as a blogger and as a columnist, no doubt you know of his excellent, truly excellent work as the host of his own show over the years on CNN and now at Fox News where he hosts his Sunday show Media Buzz. There are not many journalists and television commentators that so closely cover the intersection of politics and the media as how he does. It's a specialty of sorts. There's the media's treatment of Donald Trump, for example, and then there's the analysis of the media's treatment of Donald Trump. It's, in essence, news about the news. I think, and this is not an overstatement, rarely, if ever, has there been a time in American political history when the fourth and fifth estate's relationship with our political leaders President Trump, chief among them, has been so hostile, so bitter, so contentious, so nasty, so every other synonym uh, that you might find in the dictionary. Howie has defined it as, quote, scorched earth warfare, where the only real losers are the American people. The book he'll be speaking about this evening, Media Madness, is evidence enough of that. If you enjoy political intrigue and how things work or don't work in the White House, you really should read his book. I am a cynic oftentimes and a true junkie of politics, and I just loved it. it uh, his book's been described by some as the most important political book of the year, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. How he has authored four other great books on the subject of the media from Media Circus, where I uh, delved into the problems of American newspapers to his New York Times bestseller, Spin Cycle. Now, rather than give an hour-long boring speech that will leave you squirming in your seats, Howie has been kind enough to allow me to interview him on stage to give you the opportunity to ask some questions of him as well. I know from watching him over the years that he will be anything but boring. This will be a real treat. So if you would, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a conversation with Fox News host, Howie Kurtz.
Thank you, John. By the way, I used to deliver the New York Post. <laughs> so we got our start the same way. And let me just briefly mention how nice it is to be out here, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I wanted to let people know I was here, so I was on Twitter in the car right here, and I said, typical LA ritual, uh, got stuck in traffic on the 10 and now on the 405, and somebody wrote back, you idiot, you should have taken the 5. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a passenger, folks. <laughs> Oh, wonderful to have you here, Howie. Thanks so much for coming all the way out. Uh, I was saying to Howie in the green room, I just heard him on uh, his show yesterday in, uh, on the East Coast, and he made it out here pretty quick. And um, I know it's a long haul, so you re it's really appreciated. Delighted Howie. to be here. Um, question. Uh, I, I, let's start with Trump's, President Trump's election. Uh, you, you termed it, I think, let's say I wrote it, um, the most catastrophic media failure in a generation in terms of the media's inability to call that election or to see this coming. And I wonder if you'd uh, just amplify on that. Uh, Absolutely, because I uh, went on so many on-air panels. This is going back to the spring of 2015 when Donald Trump came down the uh, golden escalator at Trump Tower. I mean, I later had a chance to interview him for my show about a half dozen times, and I'd known him on and off since the late 1980s when I was based in New York, just a brief digression, went to interview him when he was pushing a book, The Art of the Deal, and within about two minutes he said to me, um, you know, I was just up in New Hampshire, they were scalping tickets up there, you know, if I ran for president, I would win. <laughs> and I confess at that moment, I didn't exactly envision him in the White House, but this was 1987, folks. <laughs> Uh, but to go through this whole campaign, I mean, look, journalists get campaigns wrong all the time, candidate surges, we don't get it, but the amount of ridicule that he was subjected to uh, online, in print, and again, all these panels with all these smart political prognosticators who covered all these campaigns, well, this is a very entertaining sideshow, but of course he's not going to make it to Iowa. And then he gets to Iowa, and then he wins New Hampshire. It's like, well, he's hot now, but wait until this happens, wait until that happens, and he's not going to survive this controversy. And, I don't see how he can win the nomination. And so, of course, he wins the nomination. They're all embarrassed. And finally, you know, up until November 8th, 2016, I remember going on my Sunday show two days before and saying, you know, I didn't necessarily think he was a lock, but I say, don't count him out. Polls can be wrong. Um, and I think one of the reasons I did that is not that I am such a brilliant political prognosticator, but because I didn't underestimate Donald Trump because I'd seen sort of his media mastery in the New York market. But more important, just to wrap this up, is not that we got the election wrong, but that so many of the people in my business, a business that I love and the business that I am pained to report in this book, I think is losing its way, um, didn't understand the connection that candidate Trump, non-politician, guy who speaks off the cuff, you know, not polished like all these blow-dried politicians, that he was making with so many people, particularly working class people, I said he was going to attract a lot of Donald Democrats. That phrase didn't catch on, but he did. That's how he won Michigan, that's how he won Wisconsin, that's how he won Pennsylvania. So I do think it was an enormous failure uh, by the press collectively, and then it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it. Um, you know, you use um, an interesting word on the uh, cover of the book, Howie, and it's throughout your book. Mm -hmm. And it's this concept of a war. And I wonder, you know, in most wars, you, know, you can ask the question, well, who started this war? And, and I, in your mind, was this, did the war start because the media was, just as you said, they were so taken aback and so embarrassed by not calling this, and they're so angry at the fact that this guy actually succeeded, and therefore they started the war? Or is this actually the brilliance of Donald Trump, and he's using the media as a foil, as it were, knowing that they're not all that trusted by the American people, and as a result, sees them as a terrific enemy to shoot at every day. Wh wh where did, who started the war and explain that? There's truth in all of that. I mean, the irony is that before he got into politics, and this is one of the reasons I think it was such a shock to Donald Trump, um, he generally got pretty good press. He was always, you know, in the New York Post and in the gossip columns, he was feuding with, you know, you name it, Rosie O'Donnell, Ed Koch, the characters of New York. Uh, he knew how to get press. Uh, he got press as a real estate guy. Uh, that's when I used to deal with him. I mean, even, you know, there was a running war between the New York Post and the Daily News when he got divorced from Ivana. Uh, I mean, this guy knew how to make copy. Um, so I think you probably would say the press started it with somewhat disrespectful or 
disdainful treatment when he first got into the race. But you've hit on something very important, which is this is a two-sided war. And Trump very quickly figured out uh, that the press could be a foil, that a lot of people didn't like the press, didn't respect the press. And he always describes himself as a counterpuncher. So he would start to hit back. And he would go on these shows. I mean, he, people always say, well, he got elected because he gave him all this free airtime. Well, first of all, it was a lot more interesting than most of the other candidates. But also, he did hundreds and hundreds of interviews. He did my show six times. It was hard to get. I never got Jeb Bush. I got Ted Cruz once, Marco Rubio once. Uh, Hillary Clinton doesn't even go on MSNBC. And so even when it was a bad news cycle, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew he'd get beat up of whatever the controversy was. He went on and he would turn it around and he would use the press as a foil. Um, but I think what's less important than who started it is um, how it got to be so toxic. Because one of the reasons I put truth in the subtitle is I think we have, and this was a trend that started a couple of decades ago, along with you know when Donald Trump was still uh, enjoying life probably more than he is today. Um, people uh, having uh, less and less trust in the press, faith in the mainstream media. Now people don't believe the fact checkers. They uh, are skeptical about the true squatters. So we no longer even agree on a common set of facts. I think that hurts society. I think the war, uh, which we will get into, hurts the president. Um, but most of all, I think it hurts my profession. And what I often say is that there will come a time when Donald Trump will no longer be in the White House, but I'm not sure much of the mainstream media, and I don't say everybody because I know a lot of reporters who try to be fair, but there will come a time when media can't get back that credibility, that trust once it's lost. And right now, I think it's being lost uh, at a far more rapid rate than before Trump came to Washington. Mm. I want to come back to that topic in a few minutes. Um, I have a theory on it, and I want to bounce it off you, but uh, before that, Fox and Friends. You know, I wonder if how much of this is myth and how much is reality in terms of uh, when you watch the media, what you hear is, okay, you know, the president's routine, he wakes up at a certain time, he turns on Fox and Friends, he gets them all stirred up, he goes to his tweet, you know, bang, you see the tweets and then you're off to the races for the day. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to take my word for it because a lot of times he tags Fox and Friends in some of those 5.45 a.m. or 6.45 a.m. tweets. I wake up and, wow, the world has changed. The guy's done a whole bunch of tweets. And all of us are working harder than we ever used to because the news cycle is so speeded up. I mean, look, it's a show that's very sympathetic to Donald Trump that he did for 10 years long before he thought of going into politics. It's also true that most of the primetime hosts now on Fox News are generally very supportive of this president, but not always. Uh, they've been speaking out against what he's been doing and talking to the Democrats on gun control, for example. Um, what a lot of people don't get about Fox, because I talk a lot in this book about Fox and the other networks, is that there is a news division that is separate from Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson and Fox and Friends. It's me, it's Chris Wallace, it's Brett Baer, it's Ed Henry, and we cover Trump fairly. We criticize him uh, when he deserves it. Uh, we cover him aggressively. I happen to think every president should be covered aggressively by the press. That's sort of built into the adversarial relationship. Um, and he doesn't, uh, it's not a love fest throughout the day, but a lot of people who don't like Fox and who don't like Donald Trump try to make it as well, the entire Fox apparatus is on board. On the other hand, when you flip around at night, as this is my job to do, and you see these panels on CNN and MSNBC, which are you know, six to one against Trump, if that, and you see hosts that use uh, incredibly harsh language, against Donald Trump. I mean, one example, Lawrence O'Donnell. I mean, four months into the president, he was talking about the 25th Amendment. He was talking about Trump's presidency was effectively over. He was talking about impeachment, deranged, unhinged. Jared Kushner has a line. There's a lot of behind the scenes in this book about the people in and around the president, how they deal with the press, how they sometimes are guilty of self-destructive leaks that create these controversies that we all feast on for days. Jared has a line he uses with people. He says, when people call my father-in-law unhinged, I say, no, he makes other people unhinged. I thought that was a pretty, <laughs> that was a pretty good line. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, you know, how he's, given my position mm -hmm. at the Reagan Foundation, I often get questions from people that ask, you know, compare Reagan and Trump. And um, from a media perspective, I wanted to get your take on this. Um, there's a theory, essentially, that uh, what one of the ways Donald Trump proceeds is, is a bit of sleight of hand. It's like, hey, look over here, mm -hmm. and that's the noise and the tweets and the things we hear about. But meanwhile, what's occurring underneath a lot of that noise is one day after another, he's 
taking one page from Ronald playbooks, Ronald Reagan's playbook or another, whether it be appointing conservative judges or money towards a stronger military and stronger defense or the Supreme Court justice, you know, a tax reform, mm -hmm. you name it. And I wonder to, you know, do you see that as a, is this just some incredibly brilliant strategy that's being conducted by President Trump in the White House and that they're affecting an enormous conservative agenda, and that's the kind of thing you'd expect the media to be yelling about, but they're not. They're over here. Meanwhile. Uh, mean short answer, they're not that organized. <laughs> uh, let me start with Ronald Reagan, because I was a newspaper reporter in Washington. In fact, uh, got a nice tour here before I came up, because it's the first time I've been here. And I saw, of course, the day, it was, I remember the date, I'll never forget the date, March 30th, 1981, when he was shot outside the Washington Hilton. And I was a reporter for the Washington Star. Uh, we didn't have internet in those days, so there was something on the radio. City editor said, get over there. I went to the hospital where he had been taken. And Lynn Knopfsicker, Reagan aide, of course you know, came out and briefed the press on his condition. Uh, his condition actually was more serious than we were li initially led to believe. And the Star was an afternoon paper, which of course doesn't really exist anymore. And I needed to fi find a way to get this information to the paper. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have, you couldn't, uh, text people, so I literally had to go knocking on doors near the hospital, somebody let me use the phone, I phoned it in, they put out an extra edition, hit the streets about five o'clock with the news uh, that the president had been shot and th thankfully recovered. Um, I thought Ronald Reagan got bad press, but much of the press he got, and it's also fascinating, I know you've probably, well, you know, 25 years later, a lot of the journalists and even liberal commentators who were very dismissive of the Reagan presidency have now come to look back and say, well, he was actually a master at it, whether they agreed with some of his policy priorities or not. Um, in this case, um, the let's just call them the distractions. The president's tweeting, which some of his aides, which he would do a lot less of. I mean, I talk extensively in this book about uh, Kellyanne Conway and uh, other people who've been in and out of the White House, Steve Bannon, Sean Spicer when he was there, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, um, Jared and Ivanka, who I think enormously bad press in a very unfair way. I've actually talked about that this Sunday on my show. Uh, they would like the president to do a little less of the personal tweeting. And there, some of his aides have coined a phrase for this. It's, I talk about this in the book. It's called defiance disorder. When they say, sir, don't do it, don't do it. It's political <laughs> suicide, don't do it. He <laughs> does it anyway because he's Donald Trump. And nobody tells him what to do. And he defied all the geniuses and the conventional wisdom in winning the presidency. But I think sometimes the tweeting hurts him in two respects. One is it distracts from that agenda. He might have given a good speech. He might be rolling out infrastructure week. He might be uh, touting the tax cuts he just passed or is trying to pass. And suddenly, you know, when he gives people nicknames or does some of those things on Twitter, um, it's a giant distraction, but it's a distraction that he uh, has created. And I think sometimes that takes the spotlight off his agenda. Other times, you know, we all pounce on it because, let's face it, it's often about the press. We love talking about ourselves, very self-obsessed profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you say, might say, well, why does the president do that? Sometimes he's just venting. I know from talking to him that he genuinely is offended and resentful of what he thinks is toxic and unfair coverage. And let's face it, we have, I mean, you can go back you have to go back, I think, to the week when Nixon resigned mm. to find a uh, press that is relentlessly and consistently as negative uh, as it is toward this president. Sometimes he does it because he counterpunches. And sometimes it is strategic. For example, uh, there's a scene in the book, one of my favorite scenes in the book, where the president did something I thought he should not have done. I don't think he should be punching down at individual cable news hosts. I think that's sort of beneath the president. So he got into a fight with his formerly close personal friends, Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski on MSNBC, and he had tweeted about them before, and they were, they'd known him for years, and they were friendly, and then it soured, and now I wouldn't even say it's a love-hate relationship, but it's mostly hate. <laughs> um, but the president goes on Twitter and just ends up dominating the news for days and tweets about, you know, crazy Joe and low IQ Mika and her facelift. <laughs> okay. That was not something he should have done. So I thought, well, he couldn't help himself, and he probably feels bad about it. But that day, he's talking to Anthony Scaramucci. You'll remember the mooch from his you know, 15 minutes as communications director. This is before he had joined the White House staff. And the president says, all right, tell me what you thought of these tweets. I know what you're going to say, unpresidential. And Scaramucci says, well, I didn't think you needed to go there. And the president says, is North Korea off the TV? And the mooch says, yeah. 
is health care off the TV that we're fighting over Obamacare? Yeah. Sounds good to me, says Donald Trump. Mm. So there are times when he is doing it to deliberately change the subject or move the plot line because he's the former reality TV guy and he knows he's got to hold the public's attention. And if it ticks some people off, that's, that's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Um, I want to ask you about fake news. I hear that term a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are, there's fake news. You know, if the Russians are planning something on Facebook and mm -hmm. absurd fake, fake news. Yeah. Uh, but as you well know, the president, if he disagrees with something, it, well, mm -hmm. fake news puts mm -hmm. his finger on it. And I wonder to, I mean, he, he's so masterful at doing it so often and he's so disciplined about it and so serious minded when he says it that I wonder, um, in your opinion, um, are we now, are we reaching the point where there's a lot of people in America that are seeing legitimate news that they're considering to be fake? Uh, in short, I would say yes, but I would disagree with you slightly. I think the president has overused the term fake news to the point where it's kind of been drained of meaning. Uh, I know real fake news because I've covered people who make stuff up. I, uh, in my earlier life, exposed Jason Blair at the New York Times who wrote, who wrote stories from cities he never visited, who plagiarized other people, who was fired, it turned out he had he had fooled all the editors. The editor of the New York Times, the managing editor of the New York Times, had to resign as a result of those stories when we dis they discovered the depth of the plagiarism. There was also a guy named Jack Kelly, USA Today, who fabricated foreign stories. That's fake news. Um, the president is fake um, because he says he doesn't believe the sources. And I happen to believe that anonymous sources are way overused in journalism. Now, they're important in investigative reporting. I've done a lot of it over my, in my lifetime. People would lose their jobs if their names were attached then you often have no choice. But to take political pot shots, and we've seen this in the last week, and a lot of the fake news, the anonymous sources, is coming from inside the White House and other Trump advisors who are saying things to the Washington Post and New York Times like, it's pure madness in there, uh, he is unglued. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me how quick they are, because they all resent the press, but how quick they are to use the press to dump on each other, because there's been a lot of feuds uh, in there that are very destructive to the president, but also to make the president look bad, and I guess make themselves look good. Back to fake news. Um, fake news often are stories that the president doesn't like. They may be biased. They may be slanted. They may be way too personal. It doesn't mean they're fake in the sense that I don't believe most journalists are making things up from sources who do not exist. Now, there are stories that turn out to be wrong, and CNN uh, last year had three high-profile blunders involving Trump. One of them, which is a story about Scaramucci, retracted, apologized, three top journalists fired over that bit of fake news. But it wasn't that they knew it was fake publishing, because nobody would do that, because inevitably, you know, it, it injures your reputation. So I think the phrase is tossed around a little too easily, but I also think the bar for um, making accusations against this president is way too low. When mistakes are made, they're often on the anti-Trump side. When stories uh, are just too personal or allow people to take personal pot shots without their names attached, uh, I think that's a serious problem. <clears throat> as, as I was saying, and I introduced you, Howie, I, with all of the news organizations you've been with in your career, from the Star and the Post mm -hmm. on, CNN, Fox, I have always watched your coverage of the media and thought you played it right down the middle. Um, just a top flight journalist. Thank you. Um, it's, and it's increasingly an old fashioned trade, yeah, I guess. No, it's Thank true. You. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I wondered, uh, with your move from CNN to Fox, um, I know that there's some noise around the fact, oh, well, okay, Howie, that's it. He's at Fox. Now he's just, he's mm -hmm. off from the conservative bias. Forget Howie. That's the end of his journalistic career. Right? So question, can, can you talk us through that? Sure. Um, how it's is a great it, question. How, is it, how do you feel? And, well, I'm at Fox now. And okay. so how does it feel? One of the things I do at Fox uh, quite a bit is criticize Fox News. And one of the things I did at CNN and the Washington Post was criticize those news organizations. You're not worth anything as a media critic unless you are willing to apply the same standards to your employer. Um, and I basically do the same thing that I've always done, but a lot of people who thought I was just fine before now, oh, you've drunk the Kool-Aid and all of that. Uh, I basically asked the question, is the press being fair to the president? Is the press being fair to congressional leaders? 
Uh, it's just, it is so polarizing now, and I get it from both sides. I mean, I will do a segment in which I will say, and you know, often I'm asking questions, but if I provide some analysis in which I'll say something positive about President Trump, for example, I think he has shown great courage, to, regardless of where you are on the gun control issue, by making it, putting it at the top of the national agenda. Nobody expected him to do anything, convening these meetings, which were riveting television. Press didn't really give him credit for that, challenging the NRA. Whether anything's gonna come from it, I don't know. Uh, and so I might say that, and I might say, well, you know, but on the other hand, it w he probably could, could have done better not to say that he would have run into the building uh, where the Florida school shooting took place. <laughs> and people in the audience hear what they want to hear. They, a lot of people just want to hear things that reinforce their own opinion. So I will get, uh, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, or email, you name it, you know, you've hated Trump since day one. Well, he keeps talking to me, so he must not think so. Or, you know, uh, you are so far in the tank for Donald Trump that I can't trust you. Well, I think those kinds of things show more about the biases of people out there. And people are entitled to their opinions. And I love social media, except it can be a toxic sewer, um, <laughs> because it lets everybody express their opinion. We no longer have a monopoly on the news. We no longer have a monopoly on media criticism. I happen to think that's healthy. Um, the other week I did a show, I criticized Fox three different times. Uh, including a, uh, an offensive column that had been taken down, the guy who's since retired, uh, a story that I thought was ignored for about 15 hours that shouldn't have been. Uh, I forget exactly what it was now, but it was a pretty big investigative story. Uh, maybe it was Manafort and the, the Rick Gates uh, guilty plea. So to me, you know, judge me by what I write, by what I say. Uh, if CNN does something good, I say that. There was a false charge made, and I think I was on that same show. I defended CNN because there was a false charge, and Fox had amplified this, saying that there was a scripted question at the CNN town hall on gun violence. Well, it turns out that's not true. Emails showed that they simply wanted the guy to ask a shorter question in his own words, the words that he submitted. His father had altered the email to make it look like they were feeding him the question, and I defended CNN. Um, you don't always make people happy in a job as a media critic. I didn't make everybody happy with the book. There's some people at the White House that don't like this book. There's a lot of people in the mainstream media that don't like this book, particularly those who I reveal. For example, the New York Times reporter who privately referred to uh, uh, candidate Donald Trump as a racist and a fascist and told somebody at the RNC that that person and all of them were racist and fascist for supporting Donald Trump. That's the kind of mindset, in some, in the media. It's not everybody. I always try to make that distinction. There are friends of mine, colleagues of mine I used to respect, who go on Twitter, and they say things like, this White House is feral. Um, somebody wrote after the president pulled out of the Paris Climate uh, Accord. Uh, this was a Wall Street Journal reporter who wrote on Twitter, when they think only their pals are watching. Uh, four months in, and he's threatening the planet uh, just to appease his base. So Sean Spicer called the guy up and said, is that reporting? He deleted the tweet. This is the kind of mindset the president is up against. We talked about Reagan. It's obvious that most journalists lean left, and so a lot of the opposition, for example, on immigration and other hot button issues is gonna be ideological. With Donald Trump, it's different. It goes beyond that. There are a lot of conservatives in the media who were never Trump in the campaign who don't much like this president. Now some of them work at my network. It's personal, it's visceral. I almost describe it as a cultural war. We're out here in LA, a lot of the celebrities out here, Rob Reiner uh, said that Donald Trump's lawful election, he did win the Electoral College, folks, um, was uh, the worst catastrophe since Pearl Harbor. So even if you're a commentator, even if you're a celebrity, you're a movie star, that kind of language, I think, says more about you than it does about uh, the President of the United States. <clears throat> you mentioned CNN, and I want to turn to that for a second. Mm -hmm. You were at CNN, now you're at Fox. Um, with that, I'm not interested in why you'd leave CNN personally to take a different job, but rather you I had offers from both places. I took a better offer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got a bigger audience then, but okay. Um, you didn't ask about that. But I guess what I'd say, what's, what's happened at CNN? That is a really good question, because for the years that I worked at CNN, whatever its flaws and excesses, um, it tried to be, tried to position itself as the down the middle network, the reporter's network. Uh, Fox was seen as leaning right, MSNBC obviously leans left, CNN didn't have too many hosts who were openly ideological, it was kind of dull as a result, it, it got overtaken in the ratings as a result, but at least it had that brand and people often turned to it when there was big breaking news. There is simply no question that Jeff Zucker, who I worked for briefly when I was finishing my career at CNN, uh, has decided as either a editorial proposition or as a business proposition 
uh, that CNN now needs to cater to an anti-Trump audience. Not surprising that MSNBC would do that. I am surprised to see CNN do it, to see people like Don Lemon going off every night, calling the president a racist and worse, uh, to see the panels they put on with one sort of crazy token Trump defender. Um, and, but the irony is, Compared to a few years ago, CNN's ratings are far higher. MSNBC is now, at least in prime time, sometimes competitive with Fox. I mean, Fox News still dominates the ratings landscape. But here's the irony of the press, the war between the press and the president. The president benefits uh, because he has a big fat target in an unpopular news media. And it's good box office for the press because Donald Trump is endlessly entertaining and polarizing and people tune in. So all cable news ratings are up. The New York Times digital subscriptions are soaring. Uh, Trump continues to refer to it as the failing New York Times. And yet he continues to give interviews to the New York Times. Why? Because it's his hometown paper. He's read it his whole life. And he actually wants the paper's approval. But if he's not getting it, he's, he's going to punch back. <laughs> I have five more questions on CNN, but I'm not going to go. <laughs> Talk to me after. <laughs> yeah. um, here's the theory. In the press's mind, does Trump equal Nixon? And what I mean by that is this. Um, it, it often seems to me that even reporters that one might identify as just trying to be objective, it feels to me like they, the jig's up. You know, they've figured out that this guy may not make it four years. He might be impeached, he might be thrown out, or whatever it happens to be. But be they're as surprised that he was elected as they are, they almost said he's still there. And so there's this uh, almost an antagonism that says, I'm going to write stories or report stories right now so that when that happens, I, can, I was the Bob Woodward. I was the guy that, you know, I was on the right side of the mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. Do you sense any of that out there? Because the, you'd be the absolute expert on this. And feel free to shoot that theory no, down. No, no, no. I, I, sense, I sense a whole lot of it. I completely disagree with the notion that he's not going to be around for another three years. I mean, I think that is extremely unlikely that he's not uh, going to finish his term. Where I see that most often is in the coverage of the Russia investigation. Now, unlike the president who would call it fake news and a witch hunt, there is a special counsel who was appointed by his own deputy attorney general, who has gotten a number of guilty pleas and indictments against some top, formerly top people like Paul Manafort and Mike Flynn. Uh, and by the way, the, it was the Washington Post that first reported that Flynn had lied to Mike Pence uh, about his contacts with the Russians. That wasn't fake news. There was a lot of anonymous sources. That story turned out to be true. But the, I mean, Carl Bernstein particularly, you can see why. I mean, he's on CNN every 15 minutes saying this is worse than Watergate, this is Watergate. <laughs> is not Watergate. In fact, while I don't know what Bob Mueller will ultimately have in the way of evidence, uh, it seems after a year there is precious little evidence of the thing that the investigation originally was supposed to be about, which was collusion with Russia. Now we sort of moved into, yeah, but did they cover it up? Is it the obstruction phase? Fine. I mean, those things are against the law if they can be proven. But my problem is that while I think it's a legitimate story to cover, how can you not cover it? Every incremental development, when you turn on the TV at night, uh, is, um, is cranked up to 11. And if everything is at 11, then nothing is at 11. Uh, there are a bunch of reporters from the Washington Post and New York Times who now have contributor contracts with CNN and MSNBC. And so as soon as they break something, it's usually like 7.30, 8 o'clock. Then they go on Anderson Cooper, and then they go on Rachel Maddow, and it becomes the, the story. Everything else is wiped out, including stories about the economy or taxes or health care or immigration, as, as they cover that. And so I just think the Watergate comparisons, you know, I lived through Watergate. It was really bad. It was burglaries. It was uh, wiretapping. It was uh, violating a lot of people's constitutional rights and enemies lists. Nothing remotely like that has been proven. There may be some bad apples around the president. Some of them may go to jail. So that's where I think there is this sort of sense of it's almost wishful thinking. It's wishful thinking that, well, we how else could he have gotten elected but have, to have made a deal with Russia? Uh, why, doesn't he, why isn't he more aggressive against Putin? The press, press doesn't like the fact that Donald Trump um, is trying to change foreign policy toward the Russians. And all that becomes something of, well, it must be something like Watergate. And as of now, it's not. Yeah. <clears throat> if someone in the audience uh, wanted to go home tonight and read or watch something that was down the middle, you know, something you could consistently turn to a media source where you'd say, okay, it's not right, it's not left, what would you advise they look at? 
You know, my standard answer on that is that people should come out of their bubbles and read and consume uh, news from different camps, from different sources, and then make up their own minds. I think people are really smart, you know? Uh, this whole notion of, well, you know, they're brainwashed by what they see on Fox or MSNBC or they listen to NPR, they religiously read the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times sometimes gets it wrong. Uh, the New York Times news pages are more tilted toward Trump now than it has ever been true, I think, in any president, maybe going back to Nixon. Editorial pages and op-ed pages are different. That's a place for opinion, just like the primetime hosts are people of opinion. I mean, there are journalists who I consider to be fair. Uh, Peter Baker, who I work with at the Washington Post, I think is a very aggressive but fair White House correspondent for the Times. Uh, Dan Balls, my former colleague at the Washington Post, is widely seen, sort of the dean of the Washington Press Corps now. The, the, he was a colleague of, a friend of, and a friend of mine, the late David Broder, and he's never takes cheap shots, and he calls them as he sees them. But more importantly, you know, uh, there are a lot of websites out there. Uh, I see a lot of people who just, you know, they see conspiracy theories on Facebook, maybe planted by Russian bots, who knows, folks. <laughs> Um, and they take that as the gospel. So I think, you know, in this age where we're all drowning in information, and I get into this in terms of fact checking and what to believe, um, in order to have an informed opinion, you're entitled to think whatever you want, but you ought to check out more than just one or two sources. Speaking of sources, so one of the, your main thrusts has been that this war, and one of the casualties is the truth, mm -hmm. oftentimes. I wondered. Um, the question comes down to relevance. If people are searching for the truth and don't seem to be able to find it, um, where is it? Do, uh, the theory I've got is that in social media, uh, if people are gathering their news in many respects and they're, they're getting what they think is the truth from Facebook and from Twitter and all these other sources, where does that leave in the future the New York Times and the Washington Post and the established media outlets of the world. Are they losing relevance in this day and age to social media? Well, social media has become a real force. Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg likes to say Facebook is in the media company. It may be the world's most important media company in terms of its, uh, the way it disseminates news. And all publishers have to be on it, and I have to be on it, and all of that. I think what we're seeing, and some of this predates uh, the rise of Trump, uh, but I think it's kind of like on steroids now, which is, um, in my day, when you were a newspaper reporter, basically that's all you had to do. You wrote the stories, you went home, you watched the evening news, you got the next day, maybe you did a news analysis, but basically you were supposed to be a down the middle person. First rough draft of history, which is what the late Post publisher Phil Graham called it. Um, but now, you have to have a snarky persona on Twitter, you gotta amass a lot of followers, you get to go on cable TV and be a pundit, the line has never been more blurry. In fact, it's pretty much been obliterated uh, between news, analysis, commentary, and opinion. Uh, and that, I think, has hurt these news organizations because you don't, you know, by the time you wake up in the morning before, if you get the paper, I still do, um, before it hits your doorstep, you probably know all the headlines from your phone. I mean, you take your phone out of your pocket and there you can go to any site in the world and you can get the headlines. You may get a better, deeper, more richly reported uh, version in major news organizations, major networks, but basically, there's, it's almost like it's so noisy out there that everybody has to scream a little louder, use a little harsher language. Politicians do that too. That's how they get picked up. That's how their sound bites uh, get, 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 get viewed on the news. But just to relate this a little bit to what I've been writing about, and one of the, some of the key people in the book are Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner. I mean, in the last week, has there been any doubt in anybody's mind uh, that the press would like to see them go back to New York? I mean, you can quarrel with, you know, should the president appoint members of his family? I get that. That's a legitimate concern. But Ivanka in particular, I mean, I have instances in the book in which talk about there are people out there who tend to have sort of more socially moderate to liberal views who secretly think that she's one of them. She was part of Manhattan's smart set. Her dad got elected president, and they think it's now her job, and she does not view it this way. It is now her job to change her father's position on all the things he ran at. She's not a professional politician. She'd be the first one to tell you that. She's tried to nudge him on child care, on family leave. Uh, maybe she brought people in to make sure he got both sides of the climate change debate. Um, but when, whenever the president makes a socially conservative decision, 
She gets, oh, she's a loser. Jared's a loser. She gets beat up on in the most personal terms. And then it's sort of like, how can she even work for that guy? Okay, it's his daughter. She happens to be an accomplished businesswoman. Jared was, an, was a, you know, uh, had a, a real estate empire. I'm not saying he hasn't made mistakes. I detail these in the book as well. But there is just such animus toward them in particular. And as there's been this piling on with Jared losing his, getting his security clearance downgraded and more stories about his real estate empire. I mean, some of this is legitimate reporting, but the tone of it, is all, you know, these are bad people, they have no place in the White House, and that's not our job. If you're a commentator, you can say that, but even as a commentator, you're supposed to adhere to some level of fairness. I often tell people, I did, got into it on Morning Joe when I went on to promote the book when I'm MSNBC, I'm not pro-Trump, I'm pro-reality, I'm pro-fairness. <laughs> you know, it's possible to criticize Donald Trump and criticize the press and wish that this war had not reached the level of toxic dysfunction that we all see every day. And it's getting kind of tiresome, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it makes you think what's going to be left standing right. after all this. Right, you know, indeed. It, it's tough. Um, we now, we're going to take about 20 minutes to um, take questions from the audience. And I'm sure that uh, there might be several people that have them. If what you could do is, when you have a question, obviously raise your hand. But if you could wait until we put a microphone in your hand, we'll. Uh, and we'll start over here and then we'll come to you. Do you see the social media changing the presidency from this time forward? And is the next four years going to be as entertaining as the previous two? <laughs> <laughs> A very good question. Um, I often get asked, you know, would the next president, you know, have to use social media in the way that Donald Trump did? I don't think anyone will ever quite use it the way that Donald Trump did, let's put it that way. I mean, look, it, it, most of these people who run for president and win are on some level professional politicians. They've been governors, they've been congressmen, they've even been state senators. It means that they have learned along the way to sort of play the game, uh, to choose their words carefully, to, um, to, to do it in a sort of a poll-tested way so they offend the fewest people possible. Donald Trump said he was going to come and sort of smash the China in Washington. Now, when he does that, I mean, you sort of have to do that if you're really going to affect change. Now, he hasn't been as successful as I think as he would like and the people around him would like. Uh, he wasn't able to repeal and replace Obamacare, for example. He did get the tax cuts through. Uh, right now, he's dealing with both immigration and the issue of guns. Uh, can he compromise with the Democrats? Do the Democrats want to compromise with him? Uh, often they will have a meeting, and then there's, there's a scene in the book that gives you the Trump style, and I'll come back to your social media question in a moment. Uh, Reince Priebus, uh, then the chief of staff, who was never really given the power to succeed, and he got a lot of bad press because he couldn't control all the warring factions. Um, he, was, um, he prepared a decision memo for the president on this question of should there be a ban in the military on transgender troops serving. And there were four options, and they were going to have a meeting uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning in the Oval Office to go over the, um, the options and the president to make a decision. About an hour before the meeting, uh, he's sitting with, uh, Reince is sitting with uh, Don McGahn, White House counsel, and he says, oh my God, he just tweeted, he made the decision. He picked <laughs> option number three, no meeting. Now, the president does surprise his staff this way, and I often write about how, you know, all of them find out when the rest of us find out the president has tweeted something gone off, off the rails. Now, for social media, just as, you know, JFK was the first president to use television effectively, I guess FDR the first to use radio effectively, Bill Clinton, I used to write about this, revolutionary. He went on late night talk shows like Larry King. He played the sax on Arsenio Hall. He talked about his underwear on MTV. At the time, the, the uproars were like, oh my God, a president can't do that. But now, of course, they all do that. They go on The Daily Show and that sort of thing. I think social media, and by the way, it's a great way, and he's got 40 million followers on Twitter, of getting around the mainstream media filter. You can post videos and things that way. Uh, it's a great way for presidents to communicate. Again, every president has his own style. I don't think we will see another Trump for a couple of lifetimes. Uh, but I do think that he has permanently changed the rules of the game. Uh, we had right here in the center, if you could bring the microphone right here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll watch way for the mic. And I have no idea how you vote. And that is and that's what I like to, to hear. your credit. I would like to just say one thing. Mm -hmm. As long as I've been voting, 
Republicans have been savaged, starting with Ron Ronald Reagan, I won't say some of the nastier quotes, Nixon, of course, the dunce Ford, who couldn't walk straight. Chevy Chase impersonation. Bush, who <laughs> lied and people died. And this president fights back, and yet no turn goes unstoned. The, th <laughs> the thing that we like is that he fights back. And the really egregious thing that really galls conservatives is that we just got finished with eight years where the press turned their head, never saw a scandal, never researched, never looked into what we know are scandals. And then President Obama recently said his administration had no scandal. To see the press so obviously ignoring such major scandals to the point that I have a doctor friend who never heard the word Lois Lerner because he only watches CBS, ABC, NBC, mainstream media. So this is why is, we so like, we're cheering on, but we're cheering on. Okay. We're cheering him on because he fights back. Let me address that. Um, I can certainly agree that Ronald Reagan uh, wasn't it, it was sort of similar to Trump in the sense that, you know, even though he had been a two term governor of California, you know, he was a movie star. Press didn't think he was going to beat Jimmy Carter. Uh, he was kind of portrayed as somebody who didn't know very much about policy, but let's face it, he turned out to be a great leader. And I say that not just when I'm sitting here in the Reagan Presidential Library. Um, George H.W. Bush, I think actually got along fairly well with the press, but by 92, his slogan, his unofficial slogan was, annoy the media, reelect Bush. Um, <laughs> now, Bill Clinton was a special case because well, I think he certainly got a lot of swooning coverage in 92. That was not the case when the accumulated scandals happened, when Monica Lewinsky happened, and the press uh, turned on Clinton uh, so fiercely that actually got out ahead of the public, who, which, which it turned out didn't approve of Clinton as a person, didn't approve of what, approve of what he had done, um, but wasn't willing to see him impeached over it. George W. Bush, I rode on the plane during the campaign. He had nicknames for all the reporters. He was very charming to all the reporters. Did they cut him a break most of the time? No. But he had actually had very good relations with journalists. And in his, I would put him in a little different category. But yes, after Iraq, after Katrina, the press collectively decided this was a failed presidency. And I've talked to people who worked for him, and he felt like he couldn't get a break. Barack Obama, I've never seen anybody get such favorable, often swooning coverage as, he, as Obama did in the 2008 campaign. The Hillary people would complain about it in the primary. I think he got a little tougher coverage in the second term as he couldn't get anything done, and, and there were various missteps. So what you like about Donald Trump, that he fights back, that he punches back, that he doesn't take it, is what a lot of the people who support this president or voted for this president like. And I often tell my friends and colleagues in the press, a president has every right to hit back against what he sees as unfair coverage. Now, do I think he sometimes goes too far? I say that in the book. I don't think the media are the enemy of the American people, but I do think we are sometimes our own worst enemy. Uh, I don't think that we're the opposition party, as Steve Bannon said, but I do think we do a pretty good imitation of it when, you know, there are 8,000 stories in a week, not just about policy, but Donald Trump cheats at golf. Donald Trump said she in China uh, is president for life. Maybe we ought to try that. It was a joke to a bunch of donors. I can't, I've lost track of how many stories I've seen taking that seriously. That's where he doesn't get uh, the benefit of the doubt. So yes, the final point here is that when I think all this negative press actually helped Donald Trump as a candidate and helps him as president. Why? Because people like you, people who either support Donald Trump or at least are willing to give him a chance uh, to see what he can do to improve the country. When the press is relentlessly negative, when the press is all too one-sided, they not only think that their guy, their champion, is being treated unfairly, they think, with some justification, that the media are looking down on them, view them condescendingly. And when I gathered the information, Media Madness, uh, I have a whole section on this. It's true, some of the liberal commentators who I used to respect, there was a headline in the Huffington Post, a vote for Trump was a hate crime, okay? <laughs> 63 million Americans committed a hate crime. There was a columnist in Salon and other places who said that Trump's culturally, said this of Trump's culturally backward voters. They should lose their health care. Maybe they'll learn a lesson next time. So now we have liberals, champions of the little guy, uh, hoping that the uh, Trump voters, you know, get sick and don't have health insurance coverage. How did we come to that point? It's what I call Trump trauma. I think all too many people, again, not all, but all too many people in my business 
suffer from Trump trauma. And I think it's having, I think it, it hurts him at times. It helps him with his base. It maybe doesn't help him with others. But most of all, it hurts this profession that I love. Yeah, I think we had one right here, sir. Um, I found that the huge irony with this Hope Hicks, she even made a, a, a thing in the Academy Awards they played on her. But when she said white lies and everybody got all upset, I said, are you kidding me? I don't know why the press didn't jump on that in a way that says everybody lies. You have to. <laughs> well, let's talk about Hope Hicks because I met Hope Hicks the first week in the campaign uh, because the entire campaign was Hope Hicks and Corey Lewandowski. <laughs> uh, and this was, and I, she actually helped me set up the first interview with Trump. So I got to know her. She is a lovely person. She is shy. She's always been behind the scenes. She is fiercely devoted to Donald Trump, and 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 he's going to feel her loss uh, because she, she is now almost part of the family. Now she's a communications director who didn't give interviews. That wasn't her thing. Uh, she provided her advice behind the scenes. So let's look at what happened, and you know, it's fair to criticize her. Uh, she has, unfortunately for her, gotten caught up. She's been interviewed by Mueller's prosecutors a couple of times. She's gotten caught up in that investigation because she was always around the president. So she had actually been thinking of leaving. She was burned out, frankly, to keep this pace going up throughout the campaign, and now uh, in the White House is, is, is almost too much for anybody. Um, she gets called up to the House to deliver closed door testimony. So we don't actually know what she says. There's no transcript. And a leaked story to the New York Times says that when asked, uh, she acknowledged telling white lies on behalf of the president, didn't say what those white lies were. But it, what got played down was she said she never lied about the Russia investigation. Well, it turns out that Republican Congressman Peter King, talking to uh, some other news organizations later, said, no, no, she was set up on that question uh, because some Democratic lawmaker said, well, would you say that you told white lies? So it was kind of fed to her. And she said, yeah, so what are the white lies? It could be uh, Mr. Trump can't make the meeting. He is busy. Uh, he's stuck in traffic. He's not going to be able to do that interview. You know, the kind of things that anybody in any office probably do. I don't know, but the point is it was a leaked story. And here's the final point. Hope Hicks didn't do what almost any sort of seasoned Washington operative uh, would do in that situation. She didn't spin her departure. She didn't have other people go on television and say, no, no, she never said that. She just said, I'm resigning, and she wanted to quietly fade away. Um, that spoke to me, that spoke volumes to me, because ultimately she didn't care about her own image, and so many people in Washington care greatly about their own image, including a lot of people who have worked and work in this White House and use the press to fight these battles in a way that I think is destructive for President Trump. She just decided not to make it about her, and that says a lot. Over here. Yes, Mr. Kurtz, in light of what you said about social media in particular and technology in general, mm -hmm. can anyone ever obtain in the future the status that Walter Cronkite once had? And if so, how might it happen? Uh, I think the short answer is no. I don't think that, I mean, I'm thinking back to, because I guess we've just passed an anniversary of this, uh, when Walter Cronkite, as the CBS anchor, took a reporting trip to Vietnam and then did a couple of long pieces on the CBS Evening News in which uh, he said, after having spent time there, uh, not that we should get out, but that he said we weren't winning and we weren't losing. It was a stalemate, which was contrary to what the Pentagon was uh, putting out at the time. I mean, there was a time when you had three basic broadcast networks, a couple of major newspapers, three major news magazines, and generally people trusted in the media the way they also trusted in government before Vietnam, before Watergate, I think, changed that forever. So no, I don't think that any single television anchor, no matter how honest, no matter how trustworthy, no matter how, per how much personal integrity that person, he or she has, will ever be trusted in a way that Cronkite was in that relatively simpler time. But I also think it's healthy for me, for you, for all of us, that um, there are now a million websites and blogs, and people can say what they want on Facebook and Twitter. At the time, if you didn't have access to a printing press or a television network, uh, you know, the most you could get was a letter to the editor. You didn't have the, the megaphone. And with that comes, yes, a lot of fake news and a lot of irresponsibility, but I think people are smart and they get to figure out who's telling the truth and who is not. So the good side of social media is it has democratized and opened up this conversation in a way that would have been unimaginable even 10 years ago. It's also speeded things up and, and left less time for reporting and fact-checking. 
The downside is anybody can say anything, and it sometimes takes the truth a while to catch up uh, with people who use it irresponsibly. Yes, here. Oh, uh, thanks. <clears throat> Hi, Howie. Um, I have a question about other parts of the media, meaning like ESPN mm -hmm. and the award shows and the, the Academy Awards and how they seemingly, I can't turn them on without hearing a sort of leftist view of the world. Uh, do you do you talk about that in your your book at all? Oh, these are these are pasted. I shouldn't I shouldn't use it as a prop. Uh, let's see here. Do I talk about it in the book? Where are my chapter headings? Chapter twenty five: Tackling the Sports World. Um, you mentioned ESPN. I'm sure many of you know what happened with the former anchor of SportsCenter, Jamel Hill. She went on Twitter and she thought, and this is a woman who covers sports for a living, uh, African-American woman who thought that it was just perfectly fine to go on Twitter and say the President of the United States is a white supremacist and the people around him are white supremacists. And ESPN's reaction was, uh, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Uh, it was kind of inappropriate, but we won't do anything to you. It was some weeks later, she got suspended for a couple of weeks for trashing uh, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, Jerry Jones, and sort of calling for a boycott, and now she's no longer the anchor of SportsCenter. Um, now, also, the president, as everybody in America knows, uh, chose to take on the NFL over the, uh, the anthem protests, made that a major issue in America. Um, Donald Trump has this way, he doesn't just sort of push legislation. He knows about these cultural issues, they are important to him, and so the sports world uh, got brought into the Trump presidency. And uh, since we're here in Los Angeles, you know, it's, it, the award shows are a classic example. I mean, they kind of toned it down a little bit last night because they were more interested in pushing the Me Too stuff, but a year ago at the Oscars, or is it two years ago, it was, it was uh, let me think now, yeah, it was um, after the president had been elected, but not taken office, Meryl Streep went on and gave an anti-Trump speech. And there's a scene in the book uh, involving Hope Hicks, the previous question, where um, at midnight, one of the reporters from the New York Times who had the president's cell phone number from the campaign, never gave it to me, by the way, um, <laughs> called to get a comment from him. What do you think about what Meryl Streep said? And he said, well, she's overrated as an actress. You probably remember this. <laughs> and he took a shot at liberal Hollywood. And um, Hope Hicks later called this reporter and said, I think using the president's cell phone to call at midnight without going through me uh, to ask him about something said on an entertainment show is crossing the line. But she's a very gracious person. She says, we'll move on. I just wanted to register that. Uh, it, it's not a good way to do business, and it didn't make me look good. And I'm sure you can't just call him up now if you don't want to. Um, so there's a culture war going on. This is not just news organizations. It's celebrities. It's sports figures. Um, it is the cool thing to do in many places to not just criticize Donald Trump. That's fine. Every president got, gets criticized. But to trash him, to call him Hitler, to, uh, I mentioned Rob Reiner uh, talking about the, it was like Pearl Harbor, and uh, Lena Dunham was sobbing in the shower, and all of this. Well, fine, but you know, what these people miss, I think, is that you know, they have an audience of fans. They're not all liberal Democrats. They are alienating people who ordinarily, and you also see this, and I spend some time in this, on late night TV. You go through every single host. Stephen Colbert is the winner. He's turned his show into an anti-Trump show. He did it when he hosted the Oscars. Um, and then there is, uh, you know, Jimmy Kimmel, who mounted the crusade for Obamacare, uh, Samantha Bee, John Oliver. I mean, the only one who's sort of not anti-Trump is Jimmy Fallon, because he's kind of apolitical, but even he's kind of moving in that direction. So what does it say when every single host in Late Night and most of the major celebrities, and you see this at the award shows, and a lot of these sports commentators decide that they've got to get their licks in against the president, too? I think it tells you about something about where the culture war is in this country. We have time for one last question. I'll give a short answer, I yeah, promise. I'll go back, back here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. When uh, my grandfather was head of one of the Washington Press Corps organizations in the middle of the last century, and he told me that his press organizations didn't want him to say when he knew that FDR was lying to the press corps or report on when he knew that JFK was engaged in some sexual dalliance because those organizations viewed their role as educational, uh, possibly boring, but trying to 
educate the people about different public policy issues. And I'm not sure when this change uh, took place to make the most personal of attacks and the most shrill of voices of the things that we hear. Is it um, financial? Um, organizations are thinking of their financial bottom line? Or, or is it, I don't know what it is, but how do we fix it? How about that? Well, first of all, uh, I don't think I'd want to go back to the days when the press thought it was a good form to sort of keep secrets of the president. And I actually talked to the late Ben Bradley, who was friends with JFK about that, and he said, sure, there were rumors about Jack, but not in a form that anybody could have printed, but, you know, did they go easy on Kennedy? Sure. Uh, is it hard? Could you imagine today a president being confined to a wheelchair and generally the public didn't know about that? Impossible to imagine. Um, so the culture changed. I mean, look, the news culture changed, the political culture changed. It's become a lot more toxic. Uh, I'm all for aggressive journalism. I am an old-fashioned, hard-driving newspaper reporter who plays an anchor on TV. Um, <laughs> but there's a line to me between aggressive investigative reporting and sort of being part of the boys' club. And in those earlier era, it was a boys' club with precious few women. Uh, where I, I miss the fact that you can, you can I, even in past campaigns I've covered, you could go out with the candidate for a couple of drinks or a dinner afterwards, things would be off the record, you'd get a better sense of them, and you could do your job better. I kind of miss that, but I certainly don't miss the days and wouldn't want us to go back to the days where there was a kind of a wink and a nod when it came to uh, uh, misbehavior, particularly misbehavior that affected the job. Mm. Howie, we cannot thank you enough for coming out here and um, entertaining and educating and informing this, this audience. So uh, with that, I just on behalf of everyone here want to say thank you so much for coming. And thank you, John. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.